Good evening and welcome to Greatest Somerville for October 9th, 2018. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest tonight is Senator Patricia Jalen. She was elected to the Massachusetts Senate in 2005. She represents Medford, Somerville, parts of Winchester and Cambridge. Senator Jalen serves as the Senate Assistant Majority Leader, Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Marijuana Policy, Chair of the Special Senate Subcommittee on Education, Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Education, and Senate Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce De Development. She also serves on the Joint Committees on the Judiciary, Elder Affairs, and Election Laws. I want to welcome you back to Greater Somerville. How do you find time to do all this stuff? That's uh, We're going to get into that later, but I want to know how you find time to chair all these things. Well, I focus on the things that are right at the moment. So for the first six months of the, this last term, I worked on marijuana pretty much. There you go. I missed a lot of things because I had to go to hearings all over the state meet with a lot of people and my but the real reason I get anything done is I have a great staff. Ah, I was waiting for that. And your staff is going to watch this and they're going to say thank you, Pat. Well, I think they know that I could not do with my work. Well, welcome, if I didn't have a fabulous staff. Welcome back to Greater Somerville, Somerville thank Media you. Center. You're no stranger down here. No, no. I used to do things here, but I know. now I and just come to you. You are a terrific supporter of the Media Center. I know that we were talking before the show that um, the rulings on the FCC between your colleagues in the, the um, House and you leading the charge on behalf of some of Real Media Center, thank you. Thank well, you. we're going to see them in court, I believe. I believe so. I believe it's not just Somerville. This is nationwide where the Trump uh, administration is letting FCC have free reign. So, and all at the behest of the big telecom companies. And you know how that works. The little guy gets it in the end. And I so. think that's the value of, uh, I keep calling it SCAT, but the media center, it's the value of it. It allows people to have a voice that wouldn't have a voice otherwise. That's right. That's absolutely right. And that's what we're very proud of here. First elected in a special election in 2005. Here we are in 2018, some of the same issues, fighting for the underdog. I'm going to let you take it away because Structure-wise, you know what you want to talk about in terms of what you've accomplished and where you want to go. Is there anything on the national agenda you want to talk about? Want to look? I'm going to I'm going to focus on things that people here care about and, Got it. and okay. maybe can do something about. Okay. And right now, I'm thinking a lot about the fact that um, we're all getting older, and the population of Massachusetts is getting older. Right now, there are more people over 60 than are under 20. Mm -hmm. And yet, we see things happen like the Somerville home closing and the uh, Windsor House at Sancta Maria, which was a adult day health center. We see a lot of institutions that have cured for older disabled people closing because the state doesn't pay enough. Those, uh, the Somerville home, did everything, the board and the staff did everything they could to keep it alive. 47 people there have lost their home uh, and are try the staff is trying to find homes for them in other institutions. But in the last 20 years, we've lost 100 rest homes. We're down to 53. The ones that go under are the nonprofits and the ones that serve the poor, that are paid for by state dollars. Somerville Home could have survived if it, it could have become a fancy uh, place that could sure. get private people to come, but they couldn't get the loans because the banks looked at their income and they saw that the rates they were being paid were unsustainable, so they wouldn't give them loans. They couldn't upgrade. That's the double-edged so, sword. You need money in order to improve services so you can get the loans. So all services that serve not just the poor. When you get older and you're disabled, you become poor right. for most people. Right. And the sad part about that, Senator Jalen, is if there is no place for less affluent folks or poor folks to go, then it falls to their families. And what happens is the family then takes on the financial obligation for the health care of the older person 
and that creates a cycle of them not being able to do financially what they need to do, whether it's send their kids to college or improve their own homes or buy their own homes. I mean, it's such a vicious cycle. And I think up until now, well, actually, what happens also is that most of the people from rest homes who are um, evicted, uh, many of them go to nursing homes, mm -hmm. which cost much more. They, they are um, an entitlement. If you're disabled and you qualify by finances and disability, the state will pay for your nursing home, and that can be $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, it's really foolish to lose these lower intensity care places. Right. And the same thing happened at Windsor House at Sancta Maria, which is in Cambridge, which did serve Somerville people as well. The adult day health rates haven't been raised, just like the rest home rates, since 2012. Most of us couldn't live on what we made in 2012, right. at least if we were living on the edge then. And their costs have gone up. Um, even minimum wage has gone up. And so, and health care costs have gone up more than regular costs. So they're just, they're, pe they can't keep up. So why can't we raise the rates to a sustainable level to keep these institutions alive to care for people? The reason is that every year when we go to Ways and Means, which I do, when I was Chair of Elder Affairs, I did, and now I'm sort of, I'm sort of legacy Chair of Elder mm -hmm. Affairs. I, I always think people come to me. Is that because you're a senior yourself? Oh, or? maybe, <laughs> but it's because for, 13 years 13 I chaired years Elder Affairs yeah. and I know all the players and I know the issues and so I will go in every year and I will say we need to preserve rest homes. We need to make a uh, way to have people stay in assisted living affordably. We need to uh, keep adult day health uh, programs open. Uh, and the argument is, well, we don't have enough money. They mm. just have to be more efficient. And there's a limit to efficiency. Even though the governor in his re-election campaign, Governor Charlie Baker, is touting the fact that we have a billion dollar surplus. Right. So if you have a billion dollar surplus, Governor, how come you're not taking some of that money to increase for the health care costs for the poor? Well, the argument on that is that it's a, it may be a one-time bump. And we have low reserves. We have reserves which are causing our creditor, not our creditors, but the rating agencies mm -hmm. to be concerned about us. So it's not as if we should spend all that money willy-nilly, but we should be spending some of it, not on things that are re gonna recur, but on things like fixing the alewife garage, not fixing it so it'll last for five to 10 years, which is what they're going to do, mm. but fixing it. 57% of the, of the T's assets are not in a state of good repair. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the T has a plan to get there in 15 years. In 15 years, do you think things are going to get worse in any of those places? No, but we'll have the Green Line. We'll talk about that later. Oh, we'll right. have a newer system in, in Somerville, but I, I understand well, what you're saying. Well, some of us saying. are going to still take the Red Line. No, I understand what you're saying, but let's go back to the nursing home thing. You know, you, we were talking beforehand and uh, the media center happened to have this schedule last week that we went up to the Little Sisters of the Poor on Highland Avenue here in Somerville. And it was amazing to me to see, as you know, in my own family, I've had over the last 10 years, you know, people with terminal illness and I've dealt with rest homes and I've dealt with insurance companies and I've dealt with Medicaid and Medicare, private pay, I have never seen a happier group of residents than at the Little Sisters. And as you know, the Little Sisters has very, very strict guidelines in terms of who can get into that home up there on Highland Avenue. You have to be poor to get in there. And it was amazing to me, speaking to one of the, the nuns up there who does a lot of the fundraising, she said in the last three years, the percentages of what they get paid by the insurance companies versus what they have to fundraise for has flipped now. So it's 60%, they have to do 60% fundraising, they're only getting 40%. Well, so. these people, they're, they're being paid by Medicaid. 
Medicaid, right. So that's the public payer. Right. And the Medicaid rates are, are too low. Most nursing homes say that they lose $37 a day on every Medicaid patient. Right. So the ones that are in good shape have private pay. But two thirds of nursing home patients are on Medicaid. On Medicaid. And if you don't start out on Medicaid, you will spend down right. if you're there very long. Right. So it's not sustainable. We can't have, I mean, it would be lovely What's to have How do we do thousands of, of little sisters of the poor. Exactly, exactly. But we don't have people willing, that many people willing to take a vow of poverty and chastity for the rest of their lives. And we don't have the international uh, reach of the little sisters. Right, right. So that's not a sustainable model. What do we do here in Massachusetts to fix it? Well, honestly, I think we need more revenue, and I think most people who've looked at it think we need more revenue. And I think the fact that the governor doesn't means he's not paying attention. He's not paying attention to the needs of older people. Um, he's not paying attention to our transportation system, which is billions of dollars in, in deferred maintenance. When, when things fall on people, well, they don't fall on people usually, but I've had concrete falling on cars and walkways. Are you talking about just Alewife no, or other parts no. of the system? No, Winchester Center yep. Station has falling concrete and they put, in, put on Band-Aids and they last for eight years and then we're back fixing it when it could have been fixed correctly the first time, but they put on Band-Aids and push it off to the next administration. It's, it, it's not new. You need somebody that's going to tell the truth. Right. Start with telling it the truth. It appears as though the only people who are going to tell the truth are the consumers who use the tea. And they're telling, they're telling elected officials, they're telling the past three governors that I can remember, three or four governors, that this system is broke. It's falling down. It's public safety issues. Um, your and cars you can't, are old. can't count on it getting to where you want to be. Right, right. So, you know, that's something that the state legislature, the Senate and the House, have continually worked on, but we're not seeing the success. Where and is we the gave success the governor the tools he wanted. Right. He said, we don't need more money, we just need more efficiency. So he has the tools, and he's had them for three years. And things are still falling down, and things are still dirty, and, and cars break down. Well, I made a suggestion. At but it's not just the tea. Driving is a... Our roads and our bridges have Really? Right. And so to say that we don't that we can fix it through efficiency. I think we've given him a chance to do that. Mm. And I, I don't think that we've done it. And in fact, he, he says we don't need new revenue, but he raises the, um, the parking fees. And we know that next year the fares will go up. Right, right. Well, f fees, fines, and whatever else we can eke out of the consumer is the way that most governments do it. Municipalities do it, the state government does it, and the feds do it. So well, and also we offloaded the the li the Green Line extension. Right, it was supposed to be paid for the by the state. It was a state obligation, but he asked Somerville and Cambridge mm -hmm. to chip in tens of th millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. That's coming out of the property taxes. That's right. That's right. That's an innovation. I don't consider that an innovation we want to encourage. L let me go. Let me stay on transportation for a minute. You know, you were talking about. Um, the governor's mantra is efficiencies, 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 and that dovetail, dovetails right into, as you know, because you're hearing it from your Medford constituents as well as your Somerville constituents, the Broadway Bridge in Somerville is going to be closed for a year. It's going to be hurting the economic livelihood of the businesses on either side of the bridge. It's going to be hurting the neighborhoods with, that will get inundated with traffic. It's going to hurt pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, commerce, everything. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that they have convinced everyone that they have to do it that way is because the superstructure itself has to be demolished. So I said to one of your colleagues, uh, Christine Barber, who was on the show uh, last week, why don't we tap into Charlie Baker, since he's got a billion dollar surplus, and have him do a temporary bridge for pedestrians and bicyclists at a minimum across the track so that you can still get across. I don't think he's going to do that, and here's why. The efficiencies that were built in to the Green Line extension, and you know, I've met John Dalton, 
He's been on the show, nice guy, but John Dalton has been given his marching orders by the Secretary of Transportation Pollock, by the governor, to say not one penny more. That's right. You're going to do it that way. You're not going to extend it out because it's going to cost us more money if you extend it out. That's my diatribe on the Ball Square Bridge. You've heard more from Medford and Somerville than I think I have. So your take on well, why you live right do, there. So. I live right there. I'm going to be affected by it. And you know, a lot of my friends are merchants in both squares, Ball Square and Magoon Square. I happen to run into um, Mayor Stephanie Burke and asked her about it. She's very angry. Just she's very angry. The sigh the sigh that came out of her was just like we're stuck. They're not going to bend on this. They're not going to. They're going to tear it down, and we're stuck for a year. So I'm sorry. And they're not interested in paying for a shuttle for ped pedestrians. Right. Right. Because it's not in their budget. It's not in the budget. Right. Moving on. Um, that was local marijuana. You touched on the marijuana thing. I have to be careful because I, I think some people know that I'm now on the licensing commission here in the city of Somerville. Um, the board of aldermen here in the city are going to transfer the licensing of recreational marijuana to the licensing commission oh. but i'm very interested to hear your take from the state standpoint the ccc the cannabis control commission has come out with hundreds of pages of regulation for this once that launches in the municipalities that are signing the agreements is that enough revenue into the city's coffer into the municipality and the state's coffers to bring in more revenue to the state, do you think? If, if it ever starts. If it ever starts. I mean, right. it's extremely frustrating to me. I had a lot of confidence in the CCC to start with, but they've made some decisions that I think postpone um, access and the opening of businesses. I think they are doing well on trying to encourage um, minority and low-income people to be, or people who've been harmed by the drug war. That was one of our goals to get people into the, into the business mm -hmm. and to be able to make money at something they might have made money with illegally before. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our goals was to kill the black market. But if we don't have any shops, the we're black not going to thrive. So people tell me, oh, I don't want people selling in my neighborhood. Really? OK, visit the high school. Oh, sorry. I, excuse me. Mm -hmm walk down any street no, in Boston. It. I mean, that, that's the truth. Uh, so the point is we want it legal and safe and accessible. And out and in the open where it can be regulated. That's right. right. But one of the barriers is that the CCC says it has no power to enforce the law. The law says that um, communities can charge, they get the 3% tax, and then they can have a 3% uh, community benefits uh, mm -hmm. impact fee, mm -hmm. but communities are asking for much more than that. Mm -hmm. And that gets against two of our objectives. One is it keeps out small businesses and encourages and gives an advantage to uh, out-of-state companies with big, deep pockets and a lot of capital. Those companies are glad to come in and pay you an extra $50,000, $100,000. Um, on top of 6% of their mm -hmm. sales. Mm -hmm. But the little guy who already doesn't have access to capital can't get started. Mm -hmm. And this negotiations with communities who are trying to get the most out of each, each uh, contract means that it's, that's one of the reasons we haven't seen any open yet. So that's very frustrating to me. Both Chairman Cusick and I wrote to them and explained what the law says clearly. Um, but as far as I know, only one community has actually followed the law. I hope Summerville will be another. Um, right now, you know, I can't comment too much about it, but right now it is in legislative matters here in the city of Somerville. I know they're working diligently. They've got their draft ordinances. I've attended many of the hearings. So, you know, my position as commissioner is to follow the law. That would be a good idea. That would be a very good idea. I know it's a novel thing. It is novel. But... Uh, I don't have any say in crafting the legislation that they have here. Mine is to question and make sure that they are following what the CCC has laid out. So moving on, you have a number of other issues I know you wanted to talk about. Housing. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah, housing housing would be another half hour show, but Ah, uh, I just went to a groundbreaking in Cambridge where they're building 98 units of uh, t many of them two and three bedrooms um, for different levels of affordability, but mm -hmm. all of them, all of them subsidized. Is this the one that was going in in Central Square? No, no. it's um, near Alewife. Down near Alewife, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really astonishing that they would be able to do that. I. I don't think just building more housing is going to relieve the pressure. I haven't seen it work yet. I don't know of any place it has worked. Just building more luxury condos does not help the people who are being pushed out. I, I see the onesie twosies that are happening in the city, in the city of Somerville, and I'm sure you see it in Medford and a few places in Winchester, but... Not Winchester so much. Yeah, it, it just... You know, I look at the conundrum that the developer has. I don't feel sympathy for mega developers. But I look at, at it has to fall to folks like Somerville Community Corporation and the, those folks that are in the business of building affordable housing. Because I don't know any developer who's going to go over and above what's, beyond, uh, what's required of him. No, and SEC doesn't live on... Air, Correct. it get it pays it gets tax credits and tax credits are real money that come out of the state budget. Right. So right. there again, you go back. Is there enough money to do the things we need? Mm -hmm. But the other side of affordability is, do people make enough money? And I think we really need to think about whether we want to have this continuing gap, and it's widening, and it's very wide in Massachusetts, extraordinarily wide in Ma in Somerville, but we don't pay daycare workers enough. Uh, I just saw, I was looking at uh, whatever it is that compares average salaries. You can make more as a dog walker than as taking care of little kids. Mm. What does that say about our values? Mm. I used to compare daycare to caring for your car. Obviously, car mechanics make more than daycare workers. What do we care about? Mm -hmm. Where is our money? Mm -hmm. How about people who care for old people? How about people who... Yes. You see what's happening here, and I, I, I can't comment too much about Medford because I don't know their economic uh, or this, the uh, demographics, but you see They're what's right happening. Behind us. You see what's happening here in Somerville is that it has flipped on its head. You have a much younger, a much more educated, and a much wealthier uh, resident who's moving in. I fear the day when the housing stock is not so much being bought by wealthier younger folks, but by investors oh. who, who are just swallowing up everything that's out there because they can, mm -hmm. they have the financial mm -hmm. wherewithal, and they are purposely leaving those apartments vacant. Well, that's certainly Boston happened. has the problem now, and I think it's going to happen. I know it in happens Somerville. in Cambridge. I don't know of cases in Somerville that I would name, but I know of people who live at North Point who say that there are buildings that are mostly empty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not because they haven't been sold. Right, and I'll tell you where it's going to start. Uh, let me just take a look at the time here. I'll tell you where it's going to start. I think it's going to start down here in Union Thank Square. Thank you so much. With that's my neighborhood. With the high rises. Yep. Yep, that's where the well-heeled international investors are mm -hmm. going to be coming in. They're going to be investing mm -hmm. million, hundreds of millions of dollars in this, this neighborhood. This neighborhood, Boynton Yard, Interbelt, because of its proximity to the capital city. So and I think that's why we need to start thinking about, I, I think the transfer tax is one thing, but there is, a, San Francisco I think has a tax on, on residences that are worth more than $2, two million. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's one way to fund um, housing, but the same, people are attacking Jake Gonzalez because he wants to attack, uh, attack he wants to tax, tax uh, endowments of universities that mm -hmm. are over a billion dollars, mm -hmm. 1.6 percent. Now, that's money that was not taxed when the people uh, received it as right. income right. because they gave it to Harvard. And the person giving that money got a tax break. Exactly. So right. they didn't get that. That money was not taxed when they right. uh, got it. And then Harvard earned I think over $3 billion last year. 
that's going to be hard. Which, and that's not taxed. That's going to be very hard road for Jay. But I, I wanted to give you some time. I know that you are you've endorsed Jay Gonzalez for governor. Take a little bit of time. Why you're endorsing Jay Gonzalez? Well, I, I saw you marching in the hot parade with him. Oh, by the way, you. I saw yes, you. Yes, but I was on foot this year. Yeah. So, I think that is for me the biggest problem the state has is the lack of truthfulness about our resources, and the unwillingness to tax people who have plenty of money. And maybe that's not the right way to do it, but UMass Amherst educates more people, more Massachusetts residents than all nine of those high endowment colleges all together. You're talking about our friends at Harvard and MIT Harvard and, and Tufts. Tufts. Yeah. And yes. So NVU so they may be giving out scholarships, but at the same time, kids are going to UMass and they can't afford it and they're dropping out mm. or they're working uh, a full time and trying to go to UMass. Or their parents are getting saddled with the loans. And right. the state is, in, is, is not able to pick up the, uh, and not being able to pay enough to keep those kids in college. So. We re I think the central issue is um, the, the gap between the rich and the rest of us. And there are a lot of, of people who are not able to send their kids to college or to put their kids, their parents in a place that is respectful and dignified. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about adult day health. Middle class people can choose to keep their f family members home, but if they're still working, mm -hmm. They need a place for the person to go during the day, mm -hmm. and those are the adult day health, health centers that are closing. So the middle class is really losing out, and we need to think about what we're going to do to fix that. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people know my story that I chose to not drop out of the workforce, but I was fortunate enough that I could stay home with my parents as they aged. Um, you know, and they not were everyone can do that. And I, you know, my heart breaks when I see people having to make a decision about do we take mom or dad into our home, make them sell their own, take them into our home, or put them into a nursing home or assisted living. It is one of the most gut-wrenching things that you can ever do to say to your parents, I can't help you, you need to go here. So, I mean, I'm with you on that, that, you know, I don't look at it as um, as charity. I look at it as society needs to figure out a way to take care of those that are less that are more vulnerable than we are, and that goes for kids and it goes for seniors. Everyone in the middle. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Get a job. I want to thank you. We're out of time. <laughs> I'm My guest has happy. been Senator Pat Jalen from the second Middlesex District. As always, stay safe, stay informed, and please don't forget to vote on November 6th. I'm Joe Lynch for Greatest Somerville. See you next time.